Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Louise Helbig. I'm the executive director of I-10. And uh, today we are having a session on design thinking. And um, I guess I can kick off with some extra good news. I want you to know that, uh, that Chuck, the Staten Island groundhog has predicted we're gonna have an early spring. So I think uh, that's good news for everybody considering we all likely uh, are getting a little stir crazy and cooped up and having an early spring will be nice to be able to get outdoors and get some fresh air and enjoy some outdoor activity. So uh, thanks Chuck, uh, the Staten Island groundhog for giving us that good news today. Um, but today's session um, uh, is about design thinking and how to use design thinking to create innovation breakthroughs in your business. Um, as I said, I'm Mary Louise Helbig, uh, the executive director of I-10. Most people refer to me just as ML. And I-10 is, for those of you who may not be as familiar, is the Information Technology Entrepreneur Network. And what we do as a nonprofit organization is uh, since 2008, uh, we've worked with over 1,200 tech startups in helping them on their commercialization journey. So when we think about an entrepreneur's commercialization journey, which starts with um, ideation, which is, uh, next slide please, uh, which is the very beginning uh, when they have a great idea in their head that they want to explore. Uh, and they move through that through validation and begin product development onto minimal viable product and then market entry, growth, and scaling. And um, Last year from our impact report, these are the numbers from our 19 report, uh, we onboarded 78 companies. And at any given time, we're working with anywhere from 120 to 150 active companies, startup companies. And as you can see from this pie, pie chart, uh, most of those companies are in that early stage, kind of right from ideation up to the MVP stage. That's where the bulk of them are. Um, and so uh, we work with them through validation, uh, getting you know their products developed um, and providing really critical uh, products and product service support to them. So, so the way we do that, our programs and services encompass several things. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so entrepreneur education is key. Uh, almost 60% of our entrepreneurs are first time entrepreneurs. And so they haven't, they may be skilled business people, but they haven't started a business before. So we have programs like our Eureka Innovation um, Ideation and Validation Program and our Investor Readiness Program that help them along that journey. And then we also provide really critical mentoring support. We have a network of over 60 mentors who graciously volunteer their time and expertise uh, to help entrepreneurs during their journey. And we have entrepreneurs in residence um, who are serial entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs who have been there and done that. And they work with some of our companies that are uh, more advanced on a more dedicated basis. And then our corporate innovation program, which this is part of that program, this innovation exchange series, uh, where we work with our corporate partners in the community and we uh, work with them to explore innovation concepts like design thinking, uh, but also we engage them with our startup community, which is a really critical and important um, kind of connection for both our startups who may not otherwise be able to engage with some of the area businesses and make sure that um, our area corporations understand the innovation that's bubbling up right here uh, in our own backyard so they can maybe take advantage of that. And then the other key service component is wayfinding. So a big part of what we do is we work with our community partners, the other entrepreneur support organizations. And if we could go to the next slide, please. And we provide, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned our, our great impact, um, which is how we measure our success is through the success of our startup. So on a product side, we look at um, how many minimal viable products they've launched, patent applications and awards, the connections we make in the community, whether that's through corporate innovation or wayfinding, the jobs they create. Um, so up to date, we're almost approaching 2000, probably by the time we produce the 2020 report and the funding they've raised, our startups have raised over 200 million. Thanks for, thanks for backing up on me. Now we can go forward. So uh, the St. Louis innovation community and the network of uh, support services that entrepreneurs can get is absolutely fabulous, but it can also be absolutely overwhelming. So our wayfinding services, that service we provide is um, making sure that they can go out into the community and find the correct resources that they need at the right time. 
So um, that's, that's really important. So they're not wasting their time trying to find their way to who they need and, and making sure that when they're reaching out, they're reaching out to the right people at the right time. Our connections in the community, we feel uh, reflect um, how well we work with our community partners. As an example, if uh, you look at Missouri Technologies uh, tech portfolio, 60% of the companies are I-10 companies. Um, these are numbers from our 2019 annual, you know, that year. But as we look uh, going forward this year and prepare our annual report, um, our numbers for uh, ARCH grants, companies that have received ARCH grants, is close to 60. And companies who've participated in uh, Capital Innovators Accelerator Program and are part of their portfolio is about 30. So that's just an example of um, how we work with our community members um, in supporting our entrepreneurs. And then uh, next slide, please. Uh, another key component of what we do is we are really focused on commitment, uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion. And we have uh, been involved with two organizations from the start and have been in uh, leadership committee uh, roles with Vision Inclusion Symposium and the St. Louis Equity and Entrepreneurship Collective. And um, our numbers reflect that. I mentioned earlier about 60% of our entrepreneurs are first-time entrepreneurs. And um, from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, 41% of founding member team members are females, 23% are African-American or Hispanic, and 18% are immigrants and 10% are veterans. And uh, we have a community partner, the Veteran Business Resource Center, who we're looking at doing some specific program programming with um, in the coming this coming year in 21 to get uh, veterans and their spouses more engaged in our entrepreneur programs. And so uh, I mentioned earlier, next slide. Um, we're here today as part of our corporate innovation program. And, um, and I also mentioned our ecosystem partners. We know we can't do it alone and we have established relationships with numerous community partners uh, who help us and our entrepreneurs. And we're also very grateful, grateful for the sponsors um, who enable us to do what we do. Uh, and those include, uh, we have a, a good contingent here today from Bear, Mercy, MTM, and RGAX, uh, those are our, some of our corporate uh, innovation partners. So thank you for your support and being uh, enabling us to provide this type of program as well as others. And um, some of you also probably heard the news in May, we became part of Lindenwood University. So with their gracious support and generosity, uh, we can continue to support the entrepreneurs in our ecosystem. So thank you for joining us today. And now I want to introduce you to our speaker, Rob Westervelt, who is the Vice President for Strategy and Innovation with Lindenwood University. And he's going to lead our session today. Good morning, Rob, and I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, ML, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for taking time to uh, join us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about innovation, but in particular, design thinking. And I know that there's a lot of uh, different kinds of people on the call. So some people are really experienced in innovation. Some people are brand new to it and especially to design thinking. So we're going to do sort of a high level view of design thinking and uh, but hopefully it will provide um, some insight into uh, everybody's work. And so I'm excited to be here and share with you. So given that we're really talking about innovation, uh, I always like to start with a definition. And this one comes from Bob Sutton at Stanford University. And he says, really innovation, the formula for it is creativity plus implementation. And creativity, we often think of innovation as Steve Jobs holding up an iPhone and think that is not me. Um, but really creativity, he says, is, is really taking old things, putting them in new combinations, and giving them to different groups of people. But the key is implementation. Uh, he, he will say, it is not an innovation until it is implemented. So innovation always begins with an insight. And, uh, and, and so what I wanna do is just give you an example of this. Uh, when I, I gave a presentation uh, on design thinking to an auditorium of 450 people, and I asked people, raise your hands if you've ever used this product. Not a single hand went up. Uh, cut all is wallpaper cleaning uh, putty. And it was used 
in the, especially in the 40s and 50s, it was a hot seller. And the reason for that is that the way that people heated their homes was through either coal or wood. And that soot that came from that source of energy would then get onto the wallpaper. Now, back in those days, wallpaper was literally made out of paper and you couldn't just wipe it with a wet cloth or else it would tear or bubble. So you had this little white wallpaper putty and you would carefully clean it off. Well, then in the late 50s, you really see the emergence, especially post-World War II, of alternative fuels. Uh, you have gas, you have electricity, and cut all products just start taking a nosedive. The owner of this company, whose last name was McVickers, uh, stopped even selling this product. Now, he happened to have a sister-in-law uh, by the name of Catherine Zuffel. And most people have never heard of this woman, but she is quite innovative. And here's what she noticed. She had an insight. She was reading the newspaper and she noticed that people were making little figurines out of this wallpaper putty. And the uh, reason they like this is, uh, one, it didn't crumble like a lot of modeling clay did, and it was non-toxic. So she had an insight. Wait a second. She was a nursery school teacher, and she said, I'm going to take this stuff to my nursery school kids. And so she talked to her brother-in-law and said, hey, what if we use this with kids? So again, she took something that existed, put it in a new combination. She said, let's add food dye to it and give it to the kids. And that is how you get Play-Doh. Okay, so when I ask people, how many of you have used Play-Doh? 100% market penetration. Now, she was not Steve Jobs. She did not have an MBA. She did not have a PhD. She wasn't uh, uh, didn't see herself as an entrepreneur, but she was an innovator. So I hope when, at the very least, at the end of this uh, time together, you may reframe yourself as more of an innovator and then also see people uh, in your organization differently. We have innovators all over the place. Uh, I love that story. So now why design thinking? Well, one of the reasons why design thinking is so beneficial is we don't always have an insight. We don't always have an answer. So we look for how can we get one? And that's really what design thinking is. And this is my own definition. Uh, but what design thinking is, is it's a disciplined process of discovering an insight, uh, creating a solution in that process, and then successfully implementing it. If you harken back to Bob Sutton, it's not an innovation until it's implemented. And so if you were to look at just the broad process, uh, this is not gonna be a surprise to pretty much anyone uh, who's familiar at all with uh, the, the process, but um, I just wanna note up front, uh, this is a, a process that's evolved over the last 30 years and people are gonna have a different uh, version of this. And I'm not saying there's just one, it's not always linear as well, even though it's typically laid out linear. People sometimes jump back and forth and all of that. So I want to acknowledge that. And you're going to see like in some processes, people will um, combine things like define and ideate or define and prototype or prototype and test. And then sometimes people don't mention implement at all. I just like to do that because implementation is the whole idea. Um, so I just wanted to state that up front. I'm going to be using a more classic version uh, of ideation that comes out of the D school at Stanford. Um, so let's begin. Uh, we, we often, uh, and I've been involved, maybe you've been involved in situations like this where we're doing design thinking, but we completely skip the empathize step. And oftentimes uh, people will refer to design thinking as human-centered problem solving. And so because it's human-centered, we want to empathize and start with uh, the people who, for whom we're trying to solve a problem. So this is a classic design problem that is given to design uh, thinking students. And usually it's either a little boy or a little girl in front of a bookcase. And the question is, what do they need? And um, again, I've asked, I've done this with hundreds of people and it's always the top three answers are, he needs a book, he needs a ladder, uh, he needs help. And then people get really creative. I've heard people say he needs a third arm or he needs like go-go gadget legs or something like that. That's great. Um, 
But at the end of the day, we actually have no idea what he needs. And that's part of the problem is when we do design thinking, when we empathize, we want to approach it in a certain kind of way. And first we want to do it without judgment. We don't want to assume we know. This little boy just may have it as his um, goal to reach the highest book he thinks he, he can reach. And he's just testing himself. Oftentimes when, when we do this uh, thought experiment, people come up with these amazing solutions. And then it turns out that the person we're solving the problem for doesn't even have a problem. And this happens a lot of times in our organizations where we create solutions to problems people don't actually have. We also wanna look at um, design thinking and approach it from an empathetic view with a beginner's eye. We wanna come with as much of a tabula rasa as possible. We wanna approach it with curiosity, uh, which means asking questions. We also wanna approach it optimistically, that we believe we can actually solve a problem. Uh, you don't want Eeyores in this uh, process who think it's not possible, right? Uh, and then you want to do it respectfully, uh, respecting the people for whom you are designing uh, the solution. I love this quote from Tim Brown, who's now the chair of IDEO, which is a design thinking group out in Silicon Valley. See the world through uh, uh, the eyes of others, understand the world through their experiences, and feel the world through their emotions. So how do we do this? Okay, th this poor soul here in this picture is actually part of a uh, uh, design thinking process I went through where I was uh, assigned to evaluate the check-in, check-out process at a hotel uh, in Oregon, in wine country. And, uh, and so it, the reason why we don't do this, this step a lot of times is because it's super uncomfortable you actually have to get into their world and talk to strangers. And that can be a little bit intimidating. And we could spend an entire webinar on each one of these pieces, just so you know. So I'm, I'm staying pretty high level. But we wanna get into the lives of our, our users by one, immersing ourselves in their environment. And you're gonna hear from Steve Blank in a bit where he talks about you need to get out of your office. Um, and then two, we need to observe. Uh, oftentimes we think design thinking starts with a problem statement and actually it doesn't. It, it starts by making hypotheses based upon your observations of the users that you care about. And you want to be able to tell a story about who the person is and what they're doing. How did they get to this hotel? What led up to it? Um, and then you want to think about some questions to ask them. These are open-ended questions, questions that are generative. And again, I, we could go through a whole webinar just on this process. And then you have to engage them. After you observe them, you want to interview them. Like I watched these guys come in, sit down, they ate, and I, I listened in a little bit on their conversation. Uh, and then I interrupted them and I had a whole method of how do I interrupt somebody and ask their permission to talk to them. So this is super important and it's rarely done, but it really helps you to develop the second part, which is define, okay? And this is where we create a point of view. So I love this quote from Einstein. He says, if I was given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute solving it. Now, and I don't know about your experience, but in my experience, the tendency is to switch that. We spend 59 minutes solving the problem, one minute defining it. And we end up in this sort of Dilbert cartoon uh, where we create this solution to a problem we do not have and then the problem we do have continues on, but we have this solution now that we have, which creates a new problem for us. So we want to create a point of view. And, and what you're seeing here is an empathy map. And again, like I said, we could spend this entire uh, webinar just on creating empathy maps. And so when we look at an empathy map, we're really taking what we just observed and we're categorizing it so we can create this point of view. So when we observe, we wanna say, what did they actually say? And what did they actually do? And then we want to infer from that, what did they think? And importantly, how did they feel? And that will create what's called a point of view, which is we then decide who is the user that I'm solving this problem for? And what was their need? And then what was my insight? And so I'll share you share with you mine. 
So it turned out that I was at a Holiday Inn Express in Newburgh, Oregon, which is the gateway to wine country. There's about 13 tasting rooms in that town alone. Um, I, I identified these people who were just wine tasting visitors. And I, I located the, I, I, I talked to several people, but you want to find extreme users. If you can solve problems for extreme users, then your non-extreme users, your norm, normative users will love what you do because you've made it so easy and clear to them. But what I discovered is these people, they weren't normal wine tasters. They were doing it for the first time. So they're a great group and they had a need. And the need was they needed to save time and money because they want to do a lot of wine test tasting, which can be expensive. They wanted to buy wine and they wanted to save their time. They didn't want to figure out where do I eat around this place? I've never been here before. And what they loved about the hotel is it had breakfast, a huge breakfast, and it was free, came with the hotel. And the hotel was relatively inexpensive. So the insight was, and some people actually said this, is that it, this is kind of like a and b for us. They make us breakfast and we don't have to think about that and we can save our money and go apply it to what we came here for, which is wine tasting. Now, you could take that insight and you could apply it in a new way. One of their competitors is Airbnb uh, uh, owners. And so what Airbnb does, uh, in addition, uh, that's an added value, is they give local advice on how to navigate your, your surroundings and what to do when you're visiting. So this was something we could add to the hotel where they gave advice and it added another layer of value to one of their key uh, users. So that's an example of forming a point of view. Then we're gonna go, we're gonna go into ideate. Now this is what most people think design thinking is, is ideation. As you can see, there were two very significant steps before you even get to this point. So uh, I, I love this quote from Alex Osborne, who, by the way, is the one who coined the phrase brainstorming. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. But he says, create a judgment-free environment and you'll unleash a torrent of creativity. I love that quote. So I like to say this is my new mantra. Joy is the jet fuel. You've got to be in the right state if you're going to ideate. I don't know about you, but it, I've been in meetings where we get into an ideation session and people are coming with the baggage they have from their last meeting or they're preoccupied. Something happened at home. They need their mindset to be totally altered. So when you go to set this up, and we'll talk about the setup in a, in a bit, but you want to make sure you have creative people. Now, this doesn't mean they have to be subject matter experts. They just need to be creative. You want to have food and toys because guess what? That makes people happy and you want people happy. That's when they get creative. They don't get creative when they're sad and depressed or angry. You want to make sure you have paper and markers that can be stickies or whatever. I've been in uh, ideation sessions where there's literally no paper and no whiteboard. And we're kind of like, well, where are we going to write this stuff down? <laughs> uh, you want to create spaces too to break up because when you're in a group and you want to keep these groups fairly small, under 10 people, but you want to be able to break into smaller groups so that you can really dive in and uh, have time for people to interact and talk. And then you got to warm up, uh, tell some jokes. A, a real fun uh, trick to warming up is interviewing for the worst job ever. Um, have fun, tell funny stories, get people laughing, get their energy levels up, get the oxygen to their brains. And then above all, read the rules to everybody. And that's what I'm going to go into with brainstorming. A lot of people have done brainstorming or think they have, but they actually don't know. It is a process. Uh, there was a book written on brainstorming by Osborne back in the uh, 40s. He wrote several books on this. Um, and of course, some of you are going to be very familiar with these things. One is going to be to defer judgment. Uh, when you're brainstorming, there's nothing worse than um, when people shut you down right? It doesn't increase your creativity. It creates, it, it starts decreasing it. You feel judged. You feel like you can't share ideas. And really think about back to Catherine Zufel. Imagine if she was in a brainstorming session and somebody said, nah, nobody's going to buy wallpaper putty. That's a terrible idea, right? Um, what, what ideas are being lost because we don't defer judgment? We're going to have plenty of time to judge an idea later. You want to encourage wild ideas. One of my favorite stories along this line is a light bulb company 
that was having uh, problems with their cost of packaging going up. So they swapped out some of their packaging for newsprint, which was a lot cheaper. What they found out is that all of their uh, productivity just almost ground to a halt because people were reading the funny pages and the newspaper instead of packing the, um, the light bulbs. So they did an ideation session and they started by getting playful and creative and joking around. And one of the guys said, I know what we should do. We should poke their eyes out so they can't read the paper. And of course he was being uh, facetious. But somebody said, actually, that's a great idea. We should hire blind people. Blind people are super good with tactile function and they don't read the newspaper. <laughs> uh, and uh, they said, okay, so they did it. And it turned out there was a real need for employment for the blind. Well, one thing that came out of that that they didn't expect is that companies, well, first of all, their production went back up, but then they discovered that companies actually wanted to do business with them just because of who they were hiring. So again, that's an example of how wild ideas can lead to real breakthroughs. And then you want to build on the ideas of others. When an idea comes, try to ramp it up, try to make it better, try to make it crazier, try to make it bigger, but just let it sit there. Build on it until you can't go any further. And then go for volume, not quality. Again, deferring judgment. You're going to go into the qualitative uh, part of things later when you're doing your prototyping and testing. But you want as many good ideas as possible. We, we did a um, brainstorming session at Lindenwood. We were able to generate 245 uh, ideas. So that was great. And that's going to go into our strategic plan. And then have one conversation at a time. There's nothing more frustrating when somebody has a really good conversation going. And then there's two other people talking about something totally different. And it's taking away from them adding to that conversation or hearing what that person said so they can add to it. And then share headlines. Uh, just give us the headline. We don't need to know the whole story. If the headline isn't great, uh, you know, it, the story doesn't matter. That's why headlines are so important. And then you'll see I have an asterisk at the top. Watch out for the hippo in the room. So if you're leading design sessions, uh, brainstorming sessions, and by the way, you always wanna make sure there's a facilitator who's not involved in the process of idea generation. They're facilitating it, they're keeping time. And then you have somebody who's actually writing everything down. But you want that person to watch out for the hippo. The hippo, in case you don't know, is the highest paid person's opinion. That's the person you have to watch out for because they can derail ideation in a heartbeat and say, hey, I got an idea. What do you guys think? I really like this idea. What do you guys think, right? And then everybody's like, uh, I, uh, yeah, sounds good. I guess I won't share my idea. So you want to be very cognizant of that when you're leading a group like that. And then we go into, and of course, like I said, we could spend an entire session just on ideation and how to go through that process. But I want to give you a high level view of that. Now we're going to move into prototype. And I put here, not a final product. A lot of times we get great ideas. We get super excited about them. And then we just rush and create a product or service, and we don't prototype it. This is the biggest danger of brainstorming, because if you've done brainstorming right, you're going to have people walking out of the room super excited because they're super excited about their problem. I like to ask people, how good do you feel about your problem? And you want people to say, I'm excited about our problem. And the reason why they're excited is because they know what the problem is and they know what they need to do next. And when they get the solution or some ideas, some proofs of concept, the tendency is going to be to want to jump in, create, and go to market. You don't want to do that. It's not a final product. Uh, a prototype is really a probe. And a probe is designed to go out and teach you what you don't know. Now, I'm showing you a picture here of Paul McCready. And if you don't know who that guy is, he is the one who... Uh, first successfully created human powered flight. Um, and he won a prize called, I think it's the uh, Kremer Prize, which is kind of like a, the X prize of today. And it was like a hundred thousand dollar prize uh, for human powered flight. We had to fly, I think a duration of like five minutes or something like that. And he has this famous maxim and he's kind of the father of fast fail. If you've ever heard of the concept of fast fail. He said, the problem is, is we don't understand the problem. And so he, when he was designing the Gossamer Condor, which you see right here, what he learned was 
hey, I can't, in a situation where the past is not an indicator of the future, you can't plan your way into the future. You have to design your way through the future. And what he discovered was, he said, you know what I need? I need a prototype that I can crash multiple times in the field, fix it so I can get learning faster and faster. And what his um, competitors were doing is the opposite. They would do this, and you can kind of see this graph, where they would spend most of their time planning, and sometimes they were doing their second test at the competition, and then they were failing at the competition. What McCready realized is that he needed to fail multiple times before the competition, that if he was successful in doing so, well, then he would have learned everything he could. And by the time the competition came, he had already successfully done the flight. So planning versus probing, you cannot plan your way into an uncertain future. You have to probe your way through prototyping. And then you want to test. Now, this is also, and, and I-10, uh, uh, ML was talking about this specifically, uh, the minimum viable product. Once you have a prototype, and your prototype is really, you want to think of a prototype as a rough draft. And I'll, I'll get a, an example of what this could look like. But you want to think about prototyping as your rough draft, your tool to teach you what you don't know. And as you learn what you don't know, then you start developing it a little bit more into uh, what's called an MVP. And, and this guy is Steve Blank. I've mentioned him before. He is one of the godfathers of Silicon Valley entrepreneurism um, and has, uh, has, is, is pretty well known. But I really love what he said here. And this really applies also back to the empathy uh, stage, which is no facts exist inside the building only opinions. So get outside. And what he's alluding to there uh, in that quote is really get outside and test with your customer and learn what you don't know. Now, he tells this really good story. And by the way, these slides are going to be available to you and they will have little links that will reference some of the things that I'm talking about. So you can follow up on your own if you want. Um, so he gives this really good example of you know, being in Palo Alto, he would have these really smart Stanford students who would have these great, great ideas, and they would come to him for uh, VC funding, for prototype funding. And, and so he's like, okay, you want to create a minimum viable product. And he had a, a group of students who had this really interesting technology back in the uh, about 2013-ish, when there was a lot of droughts in Northern California. What they had done is they had used some drones with cameras to take pictures of crops and they could analyze how much water was being utilized by various plants. So they could see this, these plants are getting too much water, these plants are not getting enough. And then the farmers could adjust how they use the water because water is very expensive. So they come to Steve Blank and they say, we've got this great idea. Um, we've ha had some proof of concept with the data and the technology. Now we just need $100,000 to build the minimum viable product so we can then fly it around people's farms and show them what's going on. Steve Blank says, no, you don't. You don't need $100,000. He goes, what business are you in? And they, and they said, well, we're in the data science business. And he goes, yeah, exactly. You're providing these farmers with data science that is applicable to their crops. So here's what I suggest you do create a report, spend about $10, go to the farmers themselves and ask them, would you buy this information on your crop? And he calls this, this process, the 100, eyeballing 100, he calls it the 100 eyeball uh, uh, process. Eyeball 100 customers in 10 weeks. And he calls this process really uh, the outcome of this process determining the product market fit. So when you think about like when we develop prototypes, a lot of times we don't evolve it to the point where we can actually test it with real cases, um, actual customers, those people we were talking to very early on in the empathy portion. And we don't 
ask them some of these critical questions. And he has four critical questions. He says, when you get eyeball to eyeball with your customer, question number one is, does the customer see this as a problem? Whatever your solution is. Oftentimes, we may see that the customer has a problem, but they may not see it as a problem for themselves. And so even though we've solved the problem, it doesn't mean that they're going to buy it because if they don't perceive it as a problem, they're not going to perceive it as a solution. The second one is, does the customer see this problem, uh, at, see it as a problem that they are willing to pay to solve? So that's another really important point is you may have a solution. You may have a problem. They may agree that is a problem, but they may say, but I'm not willing to pay for that solution. The third is, does the customer see this as a problem that they would pay to solve and that they would pay me to solve? That's a super important question because it may be the case that you have a great solution to a problem that matters that people will pay for, but they don't see you as somebody that uh, they have the trust to pay. And so they may see another uh, competitor as being more authoritative that might have to do with your brand. Um, and so that's a super important question. And then finally, can I actually solve the problem? You may come to the testing point and realize, oh my gosh, I don't think we can actually solve this problem. He says, if, if any of the answers to these four questions is no, it's time to pivot. And that's really important at the testing phase. Just because you get to testing with a minimum viable product doesn't mean you're done. You're still likely going to have to pivot and you're going to have to refine your idea. So this is really uh, common in high-performing companies. So this is actually old information because this is like from 2016. But you can see, look at the number of tests. Um, there are some who would argue that the organizations that do the most testing actually have the highest valuation. Um, and there's good reasons for that. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, design thinkers, uh, Diego Rodriguez, who used to be with IDEO, and then he was at Intuit. Now he's uh, working exclusively for Harvard Business School. But um, he, he would always say to organizations, and I think this is great, show me your place where it's safe to fail. One of the reasons we don't test is because testing leads to failure. And in a lot of organizational culture, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes consciously, it's not okay to fail. I, I work in higher ed. That is particularly the case. Uh, all, most of the people in our organization have been trained that failure is bad, not good. Um, but there's a great quote that, that uh, says, um, you don't learn things until, you don't learn anything until things start breaking. And so um, you want to ask yourselves that question within your own organizations. Where is it safe to fail? And are we encouraging this fast failure that the design thinking process really requires? And so I'll, I'll give you just this example from Netflix. Uh, Netflix is obviously an amazing company that's done some amazing things, but they also do some amazing tests. And for those of us who are old enough, uh, we were there before Netflix, and we saw Netflix uh, come on the horizon. Well, they were doing all kinds of interesting things. So here's some examples of some tests, some uncertainty that they had, and the learning that occurred. So think about the fact, like back in the day, when we used to go to Blockbuster, we were used to going inside of the store and selecting a video, taking it home and watching it. What was great about Blockbuster is they figured out a way to get all of the big name titles. They made these really good deals with Hollywood distribution companies to get the titles you wanted. So you always knew you could get what you wanted. Netflix said their earliest iteration was, we're like Blockbuster except online and you don't have to pay late fees. That was sort of their innovation and their insights. People hated late fees. Well, to do that, they had to send these DVDs through the mail. And they had some uncertainty. How did the logistics work, right? Um, what they had to learn through the, through the process is that you had various uh, response rates by various uh, US postal departments. They ended up having to create distribution sites throughout the country so those DVDs could move much quicker. Um, so the, the logistics were uncertain. They kept testing them, but there was still this sort of neutral quality going on. 
Then they did editorials, they tested editorials so that they can try to generate demand. They weren't sure what kind of demand they would get. And so if you recall, one of their earliest um, uh, iterations was they based everything upon recommendations. And so they would get these people to make these recommendations and editorials on videos you should rent. But then what would happen is they couldn't keep up with the stock. So people would see these things, they would go, oh yeah, I totally wanna watch that movie. They go to order and say out of stock. Of course, that was a downer. And then they go to Blockbuster. Then they uh, were testing their subscription model and trying to assess the willingness to pay. And here's where they got a real success is they found out that their customer were actually movie buffs, not your average going Blockbuster cu customer, but movie buffs. And then uh, that gave a further uh, discovery to them which was to start focusing on independent films. And one of their biggest successes was not a blockbuster movie, but a movie called Hotel Rwanda, which got really great critical acclaim. Movie buffs loved it, but the general public wasn't super thrilled with it. And that became their real breakout movie. Uh, so then they started figuring out revenue sharing options with uh, these independent film distribution companies. And then they were playing with their pricing. And of course, uh, they realized they could not charge the same price as Blockbuster. So they had to create a lower price option. Now you see them now and they just gobbled up Blockbuster like within years, Blockbuster was out of business. In fact, I think it was their 25th anniversary that Blockbuster shut down. And the last Blockbuster remaining is in Bend, Oregon. I actually drove right past it last year. And um, and it's just a, a, another indicator of how testing can take you from where you are to where you want to be. And then finally, and then we'll wrap it up here and leave some time for some questions, is implement. Uh, John Dewar, if you don't know this guy, if you haven't read his book, Measure What Matters, I'm, 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 I'm getting through it right now. Fantastic. This guy's an amazing guy. He's one of the early investors in Google and Amazon and some of the other big companies as an engineer work for Andy Grove over at Intel. But he is right on when he says, ideas are easy, execution is everything. Now, the good news is we have a lot of experience on the execution side. And what design thinking, getting good at design thinking does is it makes our execution better because we've gone through this discipline process to get our product or service where it needs to be. So, Thank you for this uh, flyby on um, uh, design thinking. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or want to go deeper. I, I know that uh, we're trying to think through some uh, follow-up webinars to this where we might do some deeper dives into some of these areas and explore design thinking, uh, maybe in, in the uh, ID8 side or, or the empathy side. Uh, so we would love to hear back from you. So please feel free to re reach out to me and connect uh, with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to stay connected with you. So with that, uh, ML, I, I think I'll hand it back to you and we'll see if we have any questions. So thank you. Yes, thanks, Rob. That was, that was great and very informative. And yeah, we already have... Um, questions queuing up in the chat. So if you do have a question, if you could put it in chat, um, because uh, if we don't get to all of them, then maybe we can do some follow-up with you and, and just make sure. Also, I've had uh, multiple questions if, if this event is being recorded, and it is, and uh, what we will do after the event is share it with you on our YouTube channel. So we'll follow up um, and provide uh, access and information on how to access to you. Uh, because I know it was, it was a lot of great information and a lot to take in. So, and, and something great to share with your team members. Um, and then um, we're going to dive into the questions. And I, I want to ask you all a very big favor. At the very end, we have two questions for you. And so I hope before you leave us, you'll just take a minute and they're very brief, multiple choice questions, but it will help us uh, and inform us about um, what you would like to hear from us going forward and what was helpful to you uh, today. So let's dive in though to the questions with the time we have left. Um, Bob asked, um, what is uh, the, the pinch point in particular where you see most entrepreneurs have the most difficulty? And I'm assuming he's thinking about with this process. Is that question directed to me or to you? I think to you. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, you're, you're like the expert on this, aren't you? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> I'll let you start and I'll follow on. <laughs> okay, and could you could you repeat the question again? Yeah, um, is there one pinch point in particular where you see most entrepreneurs have the most difficulty? Um, and I, I, I would say um, and that from our perspective, it's, it's uh, falling in love with the idea. Oh and, my gosh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. That's exactly All what right. I was going to say, yes. Yeah. And, and so, and that becomes a really big problem because um, it becomes more uh, an issue, an emotional and pride issue uh, than it is a business issue. And in, in reality, what any entrepreneur is trying to do is to build a successful business that can make money and thrive and grow. Um, but if you're making decisions based on emotion, it's going to steer you down the wrong path and there's going to, you're not going to realize your full potential. I a hundred percent agree with that. And I would add to that. They're not obsessed with their customer. Um, they're obsessed with their process or their cool tool or their great idea. And really what you want to do is you want to love and be obsessed <laughs> with your user um, because then your idea is secondary. Your user is primary. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Here's one. This one I'm sure is directed to you. Uh, how do you suggest an organization vet ideas? You mentioned the 245 ideas that Lindenwood came up with in their brainstorming session. Uh, were these all were these all the ideas, regardless of of quality and viability, or is there some form of vetting that takes place in order to have an idea make it to the ideation list um, uh, yes. on the front end of the pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I would recommend creating a process. That's one of the things that we did is you create a process. You know, obviously you want to generate as many ideas as you, you can, but then you create a process. For us, we created a pitch process and we created smaller teams that had a set of ideas and they decided which ones they were most passionate about moving forward uh, for the reasons given. And then whether they wanted to pitch it or whether we wanted to stick in the idea parking lot. And I think that's critical is you never want to get rid of any ideas you come up with. Create a parking lot for those ideas because you'll never regret keeping that idea because you'll be in that meeting and you'll say, oh my gosh, remember when we were in that design thinking session and you said something, what was it? And then you're like, oh, we totally forgot. We didn't keep it. But create a process that you can validate those ideas. The process we created was pitching. And so people had to do a formal pitch. And then we had people review those pitches, uh, people within the organization. And so we were able to rank them that way, but create a process. Yeah, great. And this one um, I particularly like, so I am gonna jump in on the answer on this one okay. too. So is there a self-awareness test that innovators could take to help them understand what mindset and behaviors are critical to design thinking? Um, uh, that they just, they struggle with most. Uh, so what can they be aware of? So. I particularly love this question because um, I-10 has launched the Eureka Experience, which is a program that has two components. One is ideation and one is validation. And the first program, uh, ideation, a big part of the content and curriculum is entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial thinking. <clears throat> and we go over the principles of, of you know, how to really think about your business and approach your business uh, so that you can achieve success. And, and they, you know, one of the first topics is innovators bias. So it goes back to, you know, fall in love with the, the problem, not the solution. And that's open, by the way, the uh, ideation session that we do, um, we'll have one coming up this spring and that's open to anyone. Terrific. Yeah, you know, that's particularly challenging for some engineers that I've worked with is uh, self-awareness is really important in terms of your level of empathy. There's a lot of people who brag about not having a high level of empathy. And, and you know, that's not really a badge of honor in the innovation world uh, because it means that you really have difficulty getting into the shoes and having some compassion for your users. And so I noticed there's a tendency on the technical side uh, to not have a whole lot of empathy. Like these people should be able to figure this out. So that's a good gut check for everybody to say, how much empathy do I have? And then on the testing phase, is there a certain amount of tests that should be done prior to implementation or specific areas uh, should be addressed first? Did you want to answer that one first? I'll I mean, give you that one. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, you want me to do it? Yeah, you can have that one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, one, you have to recognize that you that the environment is changing. Your organization is changing. Uh, your customers are changing. The world is changing. Now, it's never been more true than today. So we're really in a constant testing mode. Now, that being said, if, you've, if you're familiar with WD-40, and the reason why it's called WD-40 is it was the 40th trial of that recipe of water disposal. And so once you figure out the formula, then people are going to want to say, I want exactly that formula every single time. I don't want any uh, deviation. So once you lock into the thing that is resonating with your customer, then you want to create that uh, continuity and consistency. But until then, you're constantly iterating, just like Netflix did. Netflix didn't figure out, and they're still running tests. Um, but you'll know when your customers start saying, I don't want this to keep changing. You can start dialing it back and saying, okay, here's the parts that need to remain consistent. And here are the parts where we can continue to iterate. And then Mark has a question. Uh, in conducting a session on design thinking, do you recommend doing so as a sprint? Uh, when I want to make sure I'm understanding the question. Yeah, so I don't know. If, can Mark, uh, Mark wait on un unmute himself um, just so we can get a little clarification around your question? Yes. Um, so in, in doing a session with the design thinking and going through all the phases uh, that he mentioned, right? Um, do you, is it, is it more of a standard practice to do it in, in terms of like five days, you know, mm -hmm. back, back, or is it better to kind of spread it out, let's say over five weeks, one day per week, um, or do you start in one way and sort of evolve into the other? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, you know, Design thinking is not a science. Um, as much as people like to think it's not a magic formula. Now, I will, if, you've, if you're familiar with Parkinson's law, Parkinson's law is the idea that a task will take as long as the time it is given. Um, part of what you want to do is assess your people. Uh, if people are completely new to these ideas and concepts, then they're going to need some more time for them to develop. And also, people, there's going to be different people in different phases of design thinking. The people who are in the ideation aren't always the same people who are in the prototyping and the testing. So you really want to break it down to say who's doing what in this process and what is their level of knowledge. And it's always good to have people who um, have never done it before who come with a complete blank slate. So you really have to judge it. There's no real uh, precise answer. Uh, you kind of have to know your people um, and understand your culture. And, and sometimes it can take longer in a culture where ideas are not uh, freely expressed. In places where the culture is where, hey, we're, we're okay with failure and we love ideas and we love wild ideas, those cultures tend to take a shorter time frame when they're doing their ideation. When, when I was talking about our process where we created the 245 ideas, that was over less than 10 days. Um, and those were, there were a couple of sprints in there. Um, and that was in a higher ed environment. So it, you really have to look at your environment and look at your culture and look at your leadership. How much are your leaders behind this and how much do they buy into it? It could take longer if they don't. Um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have Melissa post our two question poll in the chat or there we go. Oh, great, so it's live, okay. So um, before, we, before we lose people, we'll keep going though. This, this will only take a, a quick uh, minute of your time. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, we'd like for you to tell us um, you know, how this experience was for you. And basically we, we look at the net promoter score, which is, would you refer a friend uh, to this, this program? So if you can uh, answer that for us real quickly and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, there also, I wanna make you aware there, uh, a couple people posted some um, resources in the chat. And um, if you don't see them, don't worry, we'll pull them out and we'll, we'll do a follow-up and share with you because I know there's a lot of information being exchanged and going on. Um, but one is um, a kind of a 
our, our entrepreneur in residence GV shared a uh, nostalgia kind of thing on uh, Airbnb and Blockbuster. And also, uh, let me go back here while you're doing that. Uh, there's also some information on uh, the Osborne Parnes uh, creative problem solving uh, for vetting. So uh, that's, that's also a great resource. Again, we'll, we'll share these with you as well. So um, if we'll give it just another few seconds here on the poll, if everybody yeah. can respond. They have both questions at the same time. Emma. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah, so that people are answering both. So we're good. Oh, wonderful. You can, okay. keep, you can keep taking questions for four minutes while they. Great. Yeah. All right. So we'll keep going then on the, on the Q&A. Thank you for, for giving us that feedback. It really is important that we understand that what we're doing is providing value to you and is a good use of your time and also uh, perspective on what's going to be really helpful to you going forward so that we can, you know, schedule topics that are going to be really meaningful. Okay. So. Uh, let me go back here and find out where I was in the list. Uh, yeah, Connie also posted information on our Eureka ideation program, which will be coming up this spring. Um, uh, let's see. So David Weaver, how do practices like jobs to be done fit in? Mm, Could you yeah. unmute and just kind of give us a little more context on that? Yeah, how do practices like jobs be done fit in? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of competing, you know, there, there's a, a lot of these kind of corporate developed methodologies that have sprung off work like Clayton Christensen. And then, of course, there's um, always, the, you can always go back to some of the real granddaddies like um, Porter and Drucker, which mm -hmm. are my bedrocks, but I mean, which there's measurement, there's Drucker. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious, is like jobs to be done a competing ideology, for example, compared to um, the Osborne Parnes or are these, these compatible or do you use different styles or? Mm -hmm. No, that's actually a really, really good question. And I think where jobs to be done really comes into play is in the creation of the point of view when you're sort of doing that, that overlap of empathy and defining, um, because you're really looking at like that, that case of when I was doing the check-in check-out process at that hotel, they had a series of jobs to be done. You know, they were like, I need to find a place to eat. I need to figure out how I'm going to get to all of these uh, tasting rooms. I need to figure out how I'm gonna afford to do all this stuff, right? And so you see all these jobs to be done. And then the question is really, who are they going to hire to um, get these jobs done for them? And what that hotel discovered is that they had this opportunity to be hired by more people who would normally go to an Airbnb uh, to, to do their wine tasting. And so I think, I think jobs to be done theory definitely fits into the design thinking process and is incorporated in it. All right. Well, with that, we're right up um, at 930. Rob, thank you for joining us today and, and sharing this information. It was, it was got a lot of positive feedback uh, in the chat room. Uh, people really appreciated it and enjoyed it. Um, and thank you all for joining us and spending time with us today. We appreciate our corporate innovation partners for um, supporting us and offering this type of programming. And we will follow up with everyone on some of the referred resources and where to find the video. So thank you all. Happy Groundhog Day and uh, have a great day. Thank you all.